Muy buenos días para todos y para todas. La Universidad Católica de Manizales se enorgullece muchísimo de poderles dar la más cordial bienvenida a este webinar que tenemos durante esta mañana de hoy, lunes 17 de abril, cuando ya van siendo las 11 de la mañana, eh, 5 minutos. Mi nombre es Alejandro Marín, de la Oficina de Comunicaciones de la Universidad Católica de Manizales, y me complace muchísimo presentar en este momento desde uno de los auditorios de aquí de la Universidad Católica de Manizales al doctor Javier Mauricio Naranjo, quien nos va a contar a profundidad en este momento en compañía de todo el equipo de la Facultad de Ingeniería y Arquitectura. Allí tenemos a la dirección del Programa de Ingeniería Ambiental, también la dirección de la maestría en Ecoingeniería y la maestría en Teledetección. ¿De qué se trata ese webinar que vamos a estar viviendo durante esta mañana? Y un poco sobre el invitado que tenemos en este momento conectado desde Portland, Oregon. Javier Mauricio Naranjo, bienvenido. Muchas gracias Alejandro, un saludo muy especial para ti y bueno y para todos los estudiantes que se encuentran aquí en el auditorio eh, para el programa de Ingeniería Ambiental, para la ma las maestrías en Ecoingeniería y en Teledetección, pues es un placer contar con Weston en, esta, en este día de hoy, en donde en estos espacios nosotros queremos eh, intercambiar experiencias de cómo se hace la gestión ambiental en otros países, eh, cómo son los procesos de conservación y de restauración ecológica y específicamente en este caso pues tendremos la oportunidad de que Weston nos cuente su amplia experiencia en cómo ha trabajado a través de las cuencas, el uso sostenible del agua y en el tema de recuperación y, y restauración ecológica en algunas de las principales cuencas que ha tenido la oportunidad de trabajar en los Estados Unidos. Para, el, para los programas es un, una oportunidad abrirle este espacio también para que los estudiantes puedan conocer eh, cómo se trabaja en otros países y eh, podamos aprender muchísimas cosas nuevas. Así que muchísimas gracias a los que están conectados, a los que están asistiendo y especialmente a Weston que se encuentra en Estados Unidos. Muchísimas gracias Javier Mauricio Naranjo, por supuesto a los profes que están allí también en este momento en el auditorio, a los estudiantes que están presentes. Weston, uh, so if you can please turn on your camera so we can say hello to you. This is really a pleasure for us as a university to welcome you to this web webinar that we're going to have this morning right here. Uh, we are so happy to have you, but please, we need to know first who is Weston Dole, who is here with us uh, this morning. Hello. Hola, buenos días. Um, I want to bore you with bad Spanish, so I'm presenting in English, but um, I'm Weston, I'm from, uh, I live in Portland, Oregon. Um, should I start the presentation or should I just speak? Well, before, before we go to the presentation is, you know, really nice if we can say hi to you, but if you can tell us a little bit about you first. So oh, yeah, you, course, were telling yeah. Me you, uh, you were telling me you're from Chicago and you're living, how long ago are you living in Portland and, and all that? Oh, okay, yeah. I, um, born in Chicago, uh, grew up there in Kansas City, in the middle part of the United States, and then I moved to the West Coast, uh, West Side by the Pacific, in Portland, Oregon, um, where I work as a engineer in agriculture. Um, It's a very beautiful area where I'm from, where I live. Um, very nice to go outside, see the mountains, see the beach, see the ocean. Um, yeah, and I visited Colombia. I was in Colombia maybe two months ago and saw um, several cities. I was in Manizales. Um, it was very beautiful, very great honor to visit and experience the the country and um, yeah, meet some of the people at university and um, yeah, very good to start building that connection. Very happy to be here. Okay, before we go to the presentation, how different it is to be living in Chicago and you know get the chance to watch the Michigan Lake and then go to the West Coast in Portland to get the Pacific Ocean close to you. How different it is? Oh, it's very different. The Midwest, uh, in Chicago, there's no ocean, um, very flat, no mountains. And then um, 
yeah, coming out to Portland where there is, is mountain and, and lots of very diverse climate. You have um, ocean and desert and forests and, and many variety of agriculture. So it's very exciting to work and live in different places and then learn from the people in those areas and then um, share that information. And, and it's very useful, um, been very useful for me to grow my career and my experience as an individual as an engineer and as a person. Okay, as I told you before, for the UCM, it's really a pleasure to have you here with us. Uh, you know, we're gonna have the chance to listen to your presentation. Of, of course, we're hoping to learn a lot about your experience. So this webinar is called Examples of Best Practices Scenarios for Warriors Head Held in Agriculture Area. So Weston, this is your auditorium. Uh, we're ready to listen to you. Excellent, thank you so much. So I will share. Okay. Is the presentation, do you see yeah, it? it? Yeah, it is on, yeah. Okay, so yeah, I just wanted to share some examples of management conservation practices. Um, in my experience, this is the background, uh, Mount Hood. It's, it's very close to Portland. Um, up there in the foothills, they grow apples and they have vineyard for wine. Um, so many different things to grow. Uh, let's see. So some more about my background. Um, I went to university in Missouri uh, that is near Chicago. Um, I did undergraduate in geological engineering and geology. Um, then I did my master's in the same geological engineering. Then I started working for the United States Geological Survey. I, I was a hydrologist. Uh, we would collect data, monitor stream flow, try to better establish that, that data, the stream flow data and flood data for um, public and other engineering groups so that they could take that data and use it. Um, we also did groundwater monitoring and geophysics. Um, help sample that, help monitor that as well, nutrient loading modeling. Um, I did that for several years and I started working for the Department of Agriculture as a civil and agricultural engineer. We help farmers with technical and financial aid, um, planning engineering projects, helping with planting, design for irrigation systems and help them implement, help with the construction, help with the project management, and help with the monitoring after it's installed. So a little bit, just some geography for reference. So you can see here is Chicago, up here by the Great Lakes and the middle part, it's very flat, open plains, um, no mountains really. And then I started working in Portland, which is up here in the far north. There's Canada, uh, the Pacific Ocean. And here you have like, it's a big valley. There's like coastal mountains and they called the Cascade Mountains. Oops. Um, so there is mountains near me and ocean. And there is a there is valley in between. Very very uh, we get a lot of rainfall. Um, the soils are very fertile. It's good for growing. Um, so that is a little bit of background. And I just wanted to I wanted to go into a couple specific projects um, that I have worked on recently, just to give an idea. And also more briefly co cover some, some other topics 
that may be interesting and may um, be similar to what is going on at the university. And maybe we can do, um, if there are topics that are interesting or um, find further interested in, we can do um, more questions or maybe more presentation or, or something like that. But um, yeah, these are just examples of, of my experience. And um, I think that's part of why we are here is to share and learn from each other. So this is a big problem out here in Oregon, near the coast. There are many tributaries, the streams that have the undersized, the culvert pipes are too small and it is blocking the stream. So what we want to do is open the channel back up like this. We open it back up and it is wider and it is no restriction to the flow of the stream. And there are fish, salmon and other fish that need to make the, the migration, the, the travel upstream so that they can go to their habitat and spawn. And um, that's where they lay their eggs and um, the fish are born and then they make their trip back downstream and go out into the ocean where they live until they repeat the cycle. And Sorry, so, Preston, can you hear yeah. me? Yeah. Uh, two things. Uh, first of all, uh, I want to uh, talk with you about the dynamic that we want to develop this meeting. Uh, with the students, we are going to ask if they are uh, understanding uh, uh, the, the topics or if they have questions, we could have the translation in, in specific parts. So uh, when you consider uh, the correct moment, you said, okay, uh, at this moment, we could uh, ask the question and, and don't, to, not to wait at, at the end, uh, but when you consider uh, the correct moment, we could have a little stop and uh, do a little balance about the, the, the understanding of, of, of the topic. It's second, and uh, if, if you could speak, uh, more louder uh, because uh, the sound is not very good. So uh, the sound is very, very, very low. So if, if you could uh, speak louder, uh, we appreciated that. Okay, okay, no problem. Thank you. Um, yeah, so uh, every slide will stop and ask questions. Um, is there any questions so far on, on this slide or topic? Okay. Entonces estamos hablando de diferentes prácticas de manejo y conservación agrícolas y también las, las imágenes que les está hablando de erosión, se les habla de varias cosas que pueden estar relacionadas con gestión del riesgo, ¿cierto? También puede estar hablando de temas hidráulicos, está hablando de hidrología, entonces la idea es que ustedes no cojan como cada palabrita que no es necesario, sino que ustedes tomen apuntes y puedan hacer preguntas específicas y nosotros les ayudamos con la traducción, ¿les parece? Para que tampoco pierdan, porque entienden, o sea, si, no, si no escuchan, si además no entienden el idioma, pues se van a desconectar muy fácilmente. Si, por ejemplo, hay celulares por ahí que están sonando, pues eso también. De pronto eh, interrumpe la, la, la concentración de ellos, de esos chicos que quieran eh, entender el tema. Entonces, hagamos el partido, ¿les parece? 
En ese momento él está explicando un ejercicio de restauración, como pueden ver, de ese cauce de ese río, donde al principio pues estaba a través de esos tubos soterrados y lo que permite es tener canales abiertos para que los peces, porque digamos estamos hablando de ecosistemas, puedan subir en, en sus procesos de reproducción y hacer todos los ciclos biológicos que ellos hacen en la familia. Que a través de esos tubos pues va a ser mucho más difícil. También están hablando de esos temas hidráulicos alrededor de erosión de los bancos por flujo. O sea, ¿qué es lo que hacen esos, eh, todos como esas infraestructuras? Reducir la energía cinética del agua para que no haya mayor socavación de, de, del lecho de, del cuerpo de agua. Pues básicamente es como, como eso a grandes rasgos. Qué pena. Ir? Ok, Weston. Perfect. Next one. <laughs> Next one. Ok. So. Here is another picture. This is in the winter. So there is lots of rain. Uh, there is snow. Um, and there is flooding uh, because the culvert, the pipe is too small and there is blockage uh, along here and behind so that the water does not pass through the culverts. It goes around, and this is, a, this is a road. This is a road here, so it's flooding over the road. And it's no good, because if you want to cross, if you want to pass over uh, this structure, you, you cannot use the road. And uh, yeah, it's flooding, it's no good. So um, we need to come up with a solution there. Um, is there any questions? No. Okay. Okay, so we need to build a, let me go back. So we want to build, to make this, to fix this, we want to build a bridge or a culvert. Um, so we must do a geotechnical investigation. Uh, so, We pick a side, either side of the stream, uh, one side of the stream. And then um, we do a test pit. We dig down um, several, two or three meters. Uh, and we get down. It starts filling in with groundwater here. Um, and it shows that the soil is relatively unstable. Um, very rich in clay, very uh, unconsolidated. So um, the purpose of this is to characterize the soil and bearing capacity so that we could de determine what kind of structure, whether it be a bridge or a culvert. Um, yeah, and so yeah, we just take a backhoe here and dig down and then also geophysics, you can run probes uh, for resistivity. So run probes across the site and help determine, um, identify some of the soil and get a better understanding in between the space in between where the, where the test pits are. Are there any questions? Okay, perfect. Okay, no, so uh, <laughs> so we looked at some, these are some previous ones that we, previous projects we have done uh, at different locations. Here is a concrete bridge. And here is a, um, like a circular pipe. It's, it's whole, it's a whole circle, but it becomes partially buried. And so we fill it in with natural stream material. Um, any questions? No, no, continue, continue. No, you, you're, you have the translation in the slide, so it's very clear. Thank you very much. Oh, perfect. <laughs> okay, so here is a, So we develop, we survey, and we develop the topography. We use instruments to develop the topography. This is in uh, US feet. Uh, I know you are used to 
meters. But um, yeah, so we have the stream here. Um, here is the current conditions before the two pipes. Uh, and we have the highway here, the road. And then this is the access road to the property where it crosses the stream. And then so after we survey and develop the plan, um, this is where the new bridge, the culvert will go in. Um, and yeah, we have a new grading for the road. It, it is raised up above so that the whole river can pass underneath the culvert and um, help reduce the flooding and where it goes over the road. Uh, any questions? No. Okay. No. <laughs> okay. So these are just some uh, example drawings of the in the design. So we have a some weirs, um, some rock structures that go underneath the stream um, to help stabilize it so that after we do the construction and the stream begins flowing again, um, it does not move around the material and it remains stable uh, over a long period of time and it does not uh, erode away. So this is um, cross-sectional view looking down the stream, uh, cross-sectional view looking across the stream and above the stream. And we set this to uh, the flow is going this way. And um, yeah, we angle it to help prevent the head cut because head cut kind of goes, that formal erosion goes in like the opposite direction. So when it is angled like this, it helps, um, it helps resist the erosion. Uh, is that a okay or a question? Okay, okay. Do you have any question? Uh, ha, ha, have you measured the impact of that infrastructure in the in the stream? Uh, I mean, uh, if if there if you have a measure of the impact in the ecosystem or the uh, biodiversity uh, or, or, or that kind of things that or the reduction of fruits or, or something like that. Um, well, so we calculate based on, this is based on the hydraulic flow, um, the force of the water. So we need to size these rocks um, underneath to help um, resist the calculated force of the water. But then uh, on the top, we have, um, we try to simulate the stream bed or try to replicate it. So we bring in materials that are natural to the habitat and make it um, build the materials in a way that is, is natural to the ecosystem um, and help, help the population of aquatic species. Um, that is less uh, my expertise because we have, um, there are biologists, and ecologists and other people that help um, rebuild the habitat. Thank you. Thank you. Le, le pregunté si se había medido el impacto de, de la construcción de estas infraestructuras en los ecosistemas y todo. Entonces él dice que hacen simulaciones, utilizan materiales, rocas que sean naturales de, de, del entorno y eh, esos estudios del impacto sobre los ecosistemas. Que, que ayudan a, a levantar esa información como biólogos, psicólogos, que permiten ver el impacto de esas infraestructuras sobre el proyecto. Sí, pues no lo dijo, pero también lo que hacen es calcular el periodo de retorno. El periodo de retorno es esa, eh, cuánto se puede demorar un fenómeno en volverse a producir, por ejemplo, inundaciones, crecidas repentinas, entonces... Eh, puede haber un periodo de retorno de 100 años, entonces saber cuánto pues, va a durar esa infraestructura, porque pues, las, las construcciones pueden decir a 10 años, pero si durante esos 10 años se puede volver a presentar un fenómeno, 
de eso, pues ellos tienen que calcularlo para poderlo diseñar adecuadamente. Ok, thank you, Winston. Ok. Uh, ok, uh, so, yeah, this is the proposed structure. Uh, it is a uh, aluminum box culvert. It, 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 it's like a bridge, um, but it it's a full circular. And um, and this is the road passing over. So it is looking, we're looking down the stream. Um, and and yeah, we we use a stream reference with. <laughs> of the natural parts of the stream uh, to determine this distance. And then um, here inside of the culvert, we use um, stream bed, this, the material, uh, the simulated material from uh, other, the natural parts of the stream for, um, for better habitat and the aquatic species. Um, And so we must model it. We use hydraulic modeling uh, to help determine the elevation, the height of the water in the stream. And so basically we have to, um, for the large flood event needs to be able to pass underneath the structure. So we must, um, with the model, determine how much distance we have for the stream to go underneath the structure. Um, are there any questions? This is HECRAS. I don't know if this is a familiar program. Uh, there are other similar water modeling programs in, in GIS, and uh, you can use uh, AutoCAD or Civil 3D. I don't know if you're familiar, but um, are there any questions? Um, um, in, in the framework of climate change, um, this is a, I don't know if it's an, uh, a question, but uh, all the historic, historic data that you have uh, maybe could change a lot because uh, in, in climate change framework, uh, the, Could they could be if there are um, more intensive uh, rains and something like that. So in that simulation, uh, there are any factor that you are changing in the climate change scenario? Yes. Um, yes, we use um, very conservative estimates um, and climate change is impacting, I um, mean, the, the entire globe and our region, it's coastal. Uh, near the ocean. So yeah, there is a factor of safety here. Uh, we call it the factor of safety um, to allow for those extreme changes, to allow for climate change or other um, events that the model uh, based on our data is cannot predict uh, precisely. So, uh, is, that, is that okay? Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, so when we get started on a project like this, we have to dewater. So there is stream, there is water in the stream, and you cannot do construction when there is water uh, in the stream. So, We must do a bypass with this. Um, it's like a big pipe where we take it and we take a take the water and move it around the working area where we build the culvert. We take the water and we move it around and back into the stream. So the stream still flows. It just goes around. And so it is also summertime. And And in the summertime here, there is very little rainfall. So the stream is low, low flow, and we're able to move it around. Um, and so we can begin construction. Here is a uh, biologist 
uh, with the fish. So we go in and we block the area off and we take all the fish and we catch them, they catch them and they move them away from where we are doing the construction. So the fish are okay. We try to have minimal, very important and sediment, very minimal impact, very minimal disturbance to the natural area. Are there any questions? Este es un muy bonito ejemplo de cómo cuando se va a hacer una infraestructura sobre un río, ¿sí? entonces hacen una derivación del cauce como muestran a través de estos tubos. Hello. I think. Okay, well, so I, I was I was explaining uh, your 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 slide, but okay, it's okay. No, okay, it, thank you. It was frozen for one minute. No, it's no, it's the system of the sound. No, it's not. Okay, well, thank you. Okay, so. Yeah, this is an after the, the water is moved. Uh, see, there is no stream, no water. There is um, groundwater. It's come in through the soil and it starts to fill up. So there is a, a pump to and here. It goes into the ground and it removes the groundwater uh, and we move that away. So the construction stays dry so it's easier to work um here we do well, this is the beginning of the culvert and um we lay um large rocks and geotextile the fabric to help stabilize underneath the structure so um, there is no erosion and the and the foundation of the structure is very very strong uh, any questions? No. Any questions? No. <laughs> okay. And then, so uh, here is the other part of the structure. We have the wing wall. Um, forms that shape there. And then we start to backfill. And these are anchor tiebacks. <laughs> they go back into the ground so that when they are covered, this wing wall here is strong. It does not, so it does not move. Um, here's the side. We run the geotextile fabric up the side and we wrap it around the whole structure um, like a big, like a, like a tamale or like a burrito. It goes all the way around. Uh, is that okay? Yes. Okay, uh, just some more photos here. Um, the wing wall again, we use the rocks, um, place large rocks here for um, structural foundation, uh, make it stronger. Uh, over here, there's a, yeah, the backhoe, um, the buckets working, uh, lots of earthwork, lots of fill. Um, had to excavate back to fit the structure and reshape the stream. Um, and this is some of the, the fill going in here. Um, are there any, yeah, this is just a quick one. Are there any questions? No. Okay, so now we finish. Um, the stream is back flowing. Um, here's the road going over, so it's widened. Uh, it fits the natural channel. There are some rocks here, uh, rocks along the side here to help stabilize the stream bank. Um, and it's hard to see in this picture, but there is a, a fish already making the passage upstream to the habitat. Um, yeah, so overall it was, uh, successful project um 
it's been there maybe six months and it's still, uh, there's some deposition here, some gravel. Um, and as that system uh, transitions from high flow, uh, where there is much scour, uh, material is removed. And then as the, the flow, low flow, as it slows down, it, it deposits that material there. And that's how, that's how this gravel got here. Um, but I assume it, it is still moving around. Since we changed it and we designed the channel and there's some difference in topography, um, it will take some time to reach equilibrium again. So uh, are there any questions? No, no questions. Thank you. Okay. So now I'm going to talk about some different project, a uh, different topic um, where we look at um, we look at runoff from, this is a farm field. Uh, we look at the runoff that goes from the farm fields into the stream. And there is this bank erosion where the stream um, has undercut and it, it starts to erode away the stream bank and it goes further and further into the farm field. And then there is more runoff um, coming down this way. And um, yeah, there are nutrients and fertilizer um, that is on the field. So we have like nitrogen, nitrates and phosphates um, that all make their way. Yeah, this is a good uh, figure where the, yeah, you have your animals and your your crops where there's fertilizer and then they they sheet wash into the stream and there the bank uh, is erosion because there is removal there are no trees there is nothing to help stabilize um, the bank are there any questions <laughs> dinámica de cuenca mucho más común, donde hay actividades productivas, cultivos de diferentes eh, productos, actividades eh, de animales, y se encuentra en una banca que se encuentra muy inestable, que no, como ustedes pueden ver, no hay ningún eh, cordón forestal que pueda mantener la, la, la estabilidad, o sea que hasta en los mejores países también se hacen estabilidades. Entonces va a contar cómo, cómo, cómo acá están a ver todas las, las cosas que se han. Se habla de llanuras aluviales del conque, estamos hablando de un río, que se acaba a hacer por esa socavación constante por parte de, 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 de la... Uh, Weston, we were talking uh, about that peak because it's very common here in Colombia uh, that uh, that kind of streams uh, with the use of uh, crops and animals and the, the the instabilization instability of the of the bank. <laughs> so we are oh. saying it's very common that situation here in Colombia. Oh yes, yeah, very big. Yeah, very big problem in, in many places. Um, so we go to the next one. Next yes. slide. Okay. Uh, yeah, so here are some, some examples. Uh, you know, they have uh, here in Oregon or uh, near Portland where I, I work. Uh, we have the, you know, these fields that it goes, they are near wetlands. Uh, they're just like in the, the previous picture here, um, they go, um, yeah, there are wetlands nearby and they have manure, animal manure and compost in the open where it rains. And then they're same, same with here. Um, you have some compost, uh, animal manure, and then it rains and there is runoff and it goes right into the stream. Uh, that's that's no good. Um, causes a lot of problems for stream health. Um, are there any questions? No, 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 no. Question. 
Okay. So we keep going. Um, this is some, yeah, example of the, the area that I am working in. Um, you know, when the nutrients get very high, um, there is algae, algal bloom. Um, the excess nutrients create this, and then the algae grows in the stream and um, uptakes the dissolved oxygen. Um, so it is less, less quality for aquatic life. The fish um, increases in bacteria from the manure. And yeah, it's just, it's important to understand and see the impacts from this kind of agriculture. Ahí muestran un perfecto ejemplo de eutrofización por la escorrentía de nutrientes y un exceso de nutrientes que se utilizan en los cultivos. Y ahí muestran pues una foto clara, típica de un cuerpo de agua donde se encuentra la eutrofización, que es con el crecimiento típico de, ese tipo, de esas algas. Uh -huh. Ok, thank you. Of course. Uh, so this is a lot. I mean, um, yeah, just some objectives for... Uh, the study that we did is we want to develop a, a model um, so that we can show, um, you know, take limited data points because there's only so much time. We can only go sample a stream maybe once a month, once every two months. Uh, so we need a, a way to predict um, the amount of nutrients in the stream in between each sampling period, in between when we can take um, raw sample data, pure, pure data, and we can compare it to the discharge, the flow of the stream, and some seasonal variation and how um, that impacts it so that we can... Um, yeah, but create a better way of predicting what the amount of nutrients are during a certain time period. And that's so we can better create an estimate of the total nutrient output for say an entire year. And then we can say, okay, look, this much, this amount of nutrients are coming during this time. And maybe we can find some way to resolve it because we are you know, we were talking to farmers, uh, they have old ways of doing things and we need to make a way that shows the data and helps them um, understand and maybe be open to future practices, future different ways of farming, ways to progress. Um, are there any questions? Um, I, I don't know if, if you are going to talk later, but what kind of infrastructure you use to avoid the, how do you use this quarantine? What the problem? The Run off of, of nutrients to the, to the streams. What kind of infrastructure or, or, or practice are you recommend to the farmers to avoid that nutrient contamination in the streams? Okay, yeah, we, I have uh, more. Uh, in the in in the future, more slides. Okay. To to okay. explain how how to avoid. Okay. okay. Thank you. Yes. Um. So yeah, we have. I don't need to spend too much time, but yeah, this was the the watershed that we looked at. Uh, that was part of the study, um, and it, it just shows some variation over, over the time and when we have the data from um, the 60s and 70s. I haven't been, I was, this is before I was alive. So, I mean, but there were people sampling before I was, I was here. Um, so yeah, I'm just gonna keep going. So we look at, um, we do some like land use, we go, uh, some GIS data to help correlate um, 
maybe the nutrients and the type of land use here, it is 80% agriculture, um, not very many urban areas. So it's pretty safe to say, or it's, it's safe to say that more likely than not, these nutrients are coming from uh, a region of agriculture. We have different uh, study locations, different tributaries to the flows going down this way. So we capture, um, try to identify which tributaries and which streams in a large area are most problematic. Um, let me just keep going. This, uh, this is just one method we use to measure the stream quality data. Um, we use standard increment. Um, so we take um, all the way across the stream and at various depths throughout the stream so that you are sampling uh, the entire stream. Uh, are there any questions on this one? It's just some methodology. Any question? No. Question. Thank you. Okay. Uh, and this is the that was water quality. This is the discharge. So you get the um, the volume of water over a given time. Uh, sometimes they they have a, a station that measures the flow continuously. And then, so this is at a big flood. So we wanted to go uh, measure the stream that way um, when there is flooding so that we know, have a very precise measurement of, of high flow. Um, and yeah, it's a, uh, we have some acoustic device and, and other methods that help um, determine discharge data for the stream. Are there questions? Questions? No, no question, thank you. Okay. So yeah, for these type of models, we, this is a little bit more on discharge data. Um, for this kind of model, we use the average of daily mean discharge values, um, one daily mean value for each day of the study period. And here's another one, is flooding over the road. And so they try to go out and uh, measure that, that discharge that's going over the road and, and not in the stream. So uh, more discharge data is for a more, more precise model. So this is just more about the model um, that we developed. It put some observed water concentration and flux, the nutrients in the stream, um, helps normalize those calculations for flux by removing year to year discharge variability. Um, and what I'm talking, you'll it, there's more on, on future slides that helps um, visualize these concepts. So um, this is just sort of an introduction for the main concepts. Um, it helps, basically we do this so that it helps estimate the nutrient concentrations for every day of the study. And that will help us determine the total output over the, over the year. Um, so, um, yeah, and basically it, it helps place weighted regression. So we focus in on, you know, we have these data points um, throughout the study period. And it seems, it seems kind of random. There's no very little pattern, um, difficult to observe. So that's why um, we help model this. Um, and this, this is a, we don't need to get too involved, but this is just um, to be thorough. This is, this is one of the equations 
that we used in the model. Um, so we use a logarithmic scale because it is over a long period of time. It helps, uh, logarithm helps uh, present easier um, visual for variable data over time. And so we have, you know, C is concentration, that's the output. And then we have discharge uh, or stream flow, time uh, in years. Then we have the seasonal variation, uh, sinusoidal in nature, it goes up and down variations throughout the season. Um, yeah, and then we have measurements for the concentrations for the, the weighted regressions from the previous screen, the weighted regressions, they put the weight uh, around each measurement. There's more, I have more on the regressions uh, on the next slide. And so this is how we determine the weights, the product of this coefficient beta. Uh, and so there is trend, um, number of measurements in years and how each data point over the year, those consistencies, um, and those consistencies may take place over the seasonal pattern where it go, you know, the up, up and down periods where they apply lots of fertilizer, lots of rainfall, lots of runoff into the stream, um, affects the data typically. So there is some trend. And then there are discharge. So yeah, based on how much flow is in the stream, how much discharge, um, we can we can place some weight on that and help um, yeah, make some deter typical trans determinations based around discharge. Um, are there any questions? Is this is this familiar concept conceptually? Somewhat, I know it's I know it's pretty far, very specific. Yes, it's it's, it's, it's very clear. And uh, my question is, uh, is is considering these models can be affected as I talked before with the climate change? Uh, for instance, maybe the limits of of the application of these models have overpassed now in the intensive rain time rainy time or maybe in summer or dry or dry. I don't know. Uh, uh, that models could be affected with the climate change. Oh yes. Yeah, and that's a really good point um, with the climate change. Uh, so maybe, you know, we have, you know, uh, so yeah, I mean, in climate change, you know, Maybe you know the the pattern is different in in the 1980s, the 80s and 90s. So maybe we have new window. You know, more recent years where climate change is is more prevalent, more impactful. So that's a good point. That'll be um, something for future future study. Um, so I'll, I'll keep going. Yes, please. Um, this is, uh, more visuals. Um, I didn't translate this one, but yeah, more visuals on, on the previous slide. So it takes all, uh, it focuses on one period of time and the day and year, and it looks at the pattern, the trend of every day or that day for every year. So we have, um, you know, typically January 1st, we look at every year through the study period and, and help determine the conditions that are typically around January 1st, January 1. Uh, so we see the seasonal variation. Uh, so yeah, I mean, this is, um, you know, why, why we do all this. Um, it's a lot of calculation, it's a lot of statistics. Um, 
but yeah, if we look, if we look and ask the right questions, um, and looking at the land use and the watershed, we can help identify some of these trends, uh, some of this data. Um, and so this is sort of a, this is another visual. This is the, um, this is the raw data. Um, and it looks uh, somewhat, you know, you could see the trends, but it's a little bit more variable. Um, maybe, maybe less clear to see for, um, you know, at a quick look. But if we take the the model data, this is after, and we see very uh, mm -hmm. consistent trends over time. And so, when we take this data and we want want to present it. Uh, we want to show farmers or in education, uh, it is very, you know, they don't need to look hard, very difficult to see. We can present them uh, very clear. Um, and it's, you've noticed that the peak is always out in March, in the spring, when they plant, when there's planting, when there is fertilizer, when there is a lot of rain, when there's a lot of runoff. Um, so we can very clearly show um, those consistencies. Uh, we also want to determine flux, which is often referred to as load. So we can make those estimates. And like how I was saying before, we can use the estimates and um, show them we have kilograms per day uh, in total nutrient output. So we can somehow estimate a value there and and share it and sometimes you know when they're very high you know we tell somebody we tell them oh look like in recent in this time period there's been a big increase uh, over these years there must have been must be some uh, pattern or practice uh, in this in the watershed that is not good and maybe we can look at it you know, maybe help come up with some solution. Uh, and so, yeah, here's some practice, you know, that they have tried since 2010. You do a cover crop, which is planting, you know, it's not just a bare field, it's not just dirt. They um, help restore some of the crop, um, some grasses to help control runoff. You have prescribed grazing time periods where during certain season, you don't, you know, during times when there are rain and runoff, you keep the animals away from the field, away from the stream. Uh, also irrigation, some water management plan uh, so that you do not overwater. Many farmers tend to uh, use too much water. They, you can determine, uh, exactly how much the crop needs. If you have some soil moisture sensor, uh, you do not water too much. Um, and here, just some real quick and more, more of the stream bank stability type projects to prevent the erosion. You know, here's some grass to help uptake the excess nutrients. Uh, more more practices, you know, education and outreach. Um, there are a till versus no till methods. The, once again, with the fertilizer windows. So you have like open field, no cover crop, all dirt. But then here you're able to have this indigenous grasses. You know, maybe even better, you have some trees, plant some indigenous trees to help. Uh, intercept the runoff and uptake it into the plant. Uh, this is, so statistics is very boring, but so, and when we, when we present this, when we determine the, um, the impacts and we make some sort of assessment, you know, we have this, a two-tailed method. We look at uh, a time period before the practices were implemented and started, and then a period after. And then we use some statistics to compare and make some sort of determination uh, that we present if the 
you know, it gets the stream gets better, the watershed gets better, or if it gets worse. Um, yeah, here's just some some big picture data over the study window. So, and since each one of these is a, um, you know, where various practices were implemented, various practices in the watershed were implemented. So, uh, it shows that yeah, there there's a general decline. I think it's it's generally getting better as we have more education, uh, more practices, more ideas. Uh, it shows some improvement for the most part. Uh, oh, that last one, this was uh, nitrates. And this was phosphates, phosphorus, the nutrient. And yeah, they show mostly some improvement. The, the phosphorus goes, there was one bad stream, uh, one bad tributary. Um, you know, I never found out why this one was bad. Um, I started different projects, um, but yeah, I think um, this highlighted that this was this stream was in the watershed was problem. Um, so now they maybe look into some solution, um, and we look at seasonal variation. Um, you know, winter. Um, there's not a lot of activity than the planting. That was the March on the graph, the very high, highest nutrient output is in March, April, when they're planting and fertilizing. Um, yeah, this shows some output for seasonal variation. Once again, um, consistently, oh, whoops, consistently high in March. So that maybe, you know, maybe they can see there is problem in March and maybe think about a uh, better application for fertilizer, better time window. Uh, this is just some, uh, some statistical representation, the stem uh, box and whisker plot, uh, we call it, um, that shows, yeah, the highest, the most and the highest range is in the consistently in the planting season for uh, phosphates and nitrates. Um, you know, some conclusions from that study. Um, you know, the sites were typically showing improvement um, in nitrates. There is, you know, one creek, this Locust Creek, uh, one stream that showed higher uh, phosphorus. Um, yeah, when we look at those windows and those practices, we look at, you know, uh, it seems like the stream bank stability projects show good improvement. The filter strips with the planting grasses, planting trees, uh, some composting uh, manure management. Uh, so there is, we can do, uh, they can store manure. They, they can better collect it. Uh, if there are animals, they, uh, have their barn and they can collect the manure or, or, or control when the animals are out in the field. If it's very wet, they can keep them in the barn and collect the manure and store it and it'll turn into compost. And then they will um, apply it over the field at an appropriate window when the nutrients from the compost will be uh, uptaken. They uptake into um the plants or the the soils and uh yeah there's sometimes we can do some some barrier you can lift it up you can raise the soil replant indigenous trees so that when this runoff is moving towards the stream uh it is it is captured and does not enter the stream before some natural filtration uh so yeah that's that's basically the study that one of the studies i did um you know maybe if there are any questions over the study i'll go i'll just quickly go into some other examples before uh i'm, I'm finished 
tenemos alguna pregunta. Eh, ¿Eres frecuente ahí? ¿Cómo pudieron ver? Ellos monitorean a través del tiempo la concentración de los clientes que habían en los ríos y empezaron a plantear algunas soluciones para disminuir esta concentración del tiempo. ¿Soluciones como cuáles? Entonces empezaban a hacer estabilidad, estabilizaciones de, de las corrientes, eh, sembrar árboles o pasto a, a, muy, muy cerca de las orillas para que ellos pudieran tomar ahí esas plantas, eh, ese exceso de nutrientes y que llegara directamente a los cuerpos de agua. O, por ejemplo, eso que vende el compostaje y que normalmente utilizan es el estiércol de los animales y tratan el de evitar que el estiércol vaya directamente a los cuerpos de agua, sino que lo ven como una alternativa para generar compost y evitar que ese, esos nutrientes pues, lleguen directo a los cuerpos de agua y que genere la contaminación y que genere el, el tema de la autoprocesión. Ok, bueno, I was. Uh, I did a, a little review about what you said. Oh, excellent. Okay. Okay. So, yeah, and uh, this is some more. Just some now. It's some random. Uh, just to give better overview, of some other types of projects very quickly. Uh, maybe if there is some interest, um, I can uh, talk about it more some other time. Um, but yeah, we do. There's some stream bank st stability where you drive logs, they stick logs in the soil and they regrade the stream so that um, there is no further erosion. Uh, they keep, uh, this is a net to keep the runoff from entering the stream while they're working. Uh, and so we have, um, we do other irrigation pumps, pipes, um, filter pumping from a stream here. Uh, so we help make their, the watering system, the irrigation more efficient, and maybe there is less um, runoff, less pollution um, from that. Uh, this is a filter. So we're pumping from here, uh, some filter, uh, central fugal pump, um, some more, this is from a, a pond. They have the pumps or the water stored in a pond. Um, and they pump from the pond. Here they have um, some slow sand filtration filter here. And this is a, we installed a flow meter so that you can monitor the flow. Uh, you help determine how much water the crop needs and help monitor uh, the flow so you do not use too much water, uh, which causes runoff. And so uh, further down from that, we have, a, we call it drip line, drip line irrigation, micro irrigation. Uh, so it is very precise. The water goes directly on the plant in the pot, it doesn't go, it's not spraying everywhere. Uh, the big sprayers, the, the more runoff, because the more water uh, goes all over the ground, um, less water actually being used by the plant. These are hazelnut trees. You have hazelnuts. Uh, this is potted juvenile, very young. And then we have a mature, we take them and plant them in a row and the drip line, the irrigation watering is buried in the ground. See the wet along each row. So it waters directly to the root system. No spraying from the top and no less, less runoff. So it goes directly on the roots. Uh, Here is another method with the sprayer. Uh, this is a linear. You have nozzles that spray over crop and it moves on the wheels. Uh, this is potato. Um, yeah, we have some sensor here to help um, look at the soil moisture content and help determine the effectiveness of water. Um, 
So, uh, Wesson, uh, I'm sorry, uh, we have the time is finishing. <laughs> okay, out of time. It's over, yes. Uh, if you can uh, go, please, uh, more quick uh, to the conclusions, we appreciate it. Okay, perfect. Okay, real quick. Yeah, and other rainwater collection, storage, um, high tunnels or greenhouses, collect rainwater, store it. Um, we look at groundwater sources as well, um, different groundwater in different environments, aquifer, uh, natural springs, artesian springs, um, groundwater in different host material. So we observe that. Uh, maybe we help develop a well in high elevations in the mountains uh, where there are less streams, you know, the, the water goes underground and then we help um, help develop a spring uh, so that we can collect that water and irrigate when it is needed. And so, yeah, we do some groundwater investigations too, so that we go in the observation well and run geophysics or other um, measurement to help develop uh, models for the alluvial aquifer under the ground and some drilling. Um, yeah, and we do samples for water quality that way as well. We pump from the well, sample it for nutrients, for nitrates, any other constituent. Uh, yeah. And that, that is it. That is my time. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I enjoyed sharing. And maybe if there are any, any other questions. Hey, I don't know. Tenemos alguna pregunta para Weston? So, thank you very much. So, uh, Weston, uh, this is it. As I told you at the beginning, we are so proud to have you here to learn too much things about you. Uh, we hope to see you anytime soon. Yeah, I hope to see you again. Hope to, uh, yeah, share more uh, topics, of course. Okay, Weston oh. Dolde uh, from Portland, Oregon. Thank you. Thanks a lot for being here with us at the UCM. Muchísimas gracias a ustedes también, nuestros estudiantes, por estar aquí presentes, a nuestros profes, a todos, muchas gracias. Y con esto concluimos nuestro webinar. Que estén bien. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye, chao. Thank you, Thank you very much, Weston. Very interesting. Uh, all your presentation, and uh, it's very important for our